crime on Oahu dropped last year in nearly every category. That's according to the Honolulu Police Department's 2020 report. But as the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic continue to loosen, there is concern about a surge in criminal activity. From shootings and burglaries to catalytic converters being ripped off cars, is crime on Oahu on the rise? We'll ask HPD and the Honolulu prosecutor. Join the live discussion tonight on Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Like many places around the world, overall crime went down on Oahu because of the pandemic last year. According to the Honolulu Police Department's 2020 annual report, there were nearly 2,400 violent crimes reported, including murder, forcible rape, robbery, and aggravated Property crimes like burglary, larceny, theft, and motor vehicle thefts were at just over 25,000. But as pandemic shutdowns and restrictions were lifted, authorities expressed concern about a possible rise in crime. Our panel will discuss if there's been a spike, what can be done to curb activity, and how social media has made residents more aware of what's happening in their neighborhoods. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Roddy Vanek is the interim police chief for the Honolulu Police Department. Born and raised in Honolulu, he joined the department in 1999 and has worked in the criminal investigation, community affairs, and the information technology divisions. As an assistant chief, he's led the support services and administrative bureaus of HPD. Steve Ahm was elected Honolulu prosecutor last November. For 15 years, he served as a circuit court judge, presiding over 200 jury trials. He also helped create Hawaii's Opportunity Probation with Enforcement Program, also known as HOPE Probation. The program gives felony offenders strict rules and quick consequences for probationers. Honolulu City Council Member Carol Fukunaga represents District 6, which covers neighborhoods including Makiki, Punchbowl, Nuuanu, Kalihi Valley, Moanalua, and downtown Chinatown. Prior to being elected to the City Council, she was a veteran of the state legislature. And Michael Kitchens is the founder and primary administrator for Stolen Stuff Hawaii, an anti-crime group of nearly 176,000 social media followers on Facebook and Instagram. He is a retired United States Air Force combat arms instructor and a disabled veteran. Michael, let me start with you. You know, you, you kind of have your finger on the pulse of the community through your website. What is the perception that you think people have right now of the crime situation on Oahu? Well, obviously, I, I think that you know, last year was interesting to say the least, uh, 2020. From our viewpoint, it was actually not that bad. Uh, it, it felt uh, like there was almost a lull in crime. I think that was because people uh, weren't, were afraid to get out and there was less crime because of that. But then, of course, with this getting back to everything and opening back up, there did feel like there was a surge in the group statistically. And our community members feel the same. They feel that there, uh, because of everything that happened last year and this year, that there has been, percept from perception-wise, a rise in crime, you know, just from that standpoint, from social media. Uh, Carol Fukunaga, Councilwoman, you represent a lot of people. What, what's going on with your constituents? Are they complaining about crime? Do they feel oh, like absolutely. it's... Absolutely. And uh, we've had many meetings with HPD and Prosecutor Alm and a variety of community residents. In fact, some of my uh, neighborhoods are the ones that have had crime increase, particularly in terms of larceny, auto theft, burglaries, etc. So Makiki Punch Bowl, you know, Lower Makiki, uh, Downtown Chinatown, portions of Nu'uanu we have actually seen the statistics increase, and I can vouch for the number of complaints also increasing uh, tenfold. Do you think there's a connection, though, to homelessness on that in, in those particular districts? Most of the locations that um, report a lot of homeless activity also seem to have seen this increase in crime. So actually, the annual report statistics were very interesting for us because when we pinpointed the the various beats, we could see a pattern. And so now we're, uh, you know, working very closely with police and other homeless services agencies, as well as the prosecutor, to see if we can come up with a better strategy for tackling homelessness as a way to actually reduce some of the uh, crime activity. Uh, prosecutor Steve, Baum, what, what's your perception from your seat as the prosecutor? Well, I think uh, partly it's perception. And we have seen recently that woman walking along in front of Wong's drapery 
and this guy, you know, hits her with a forearm and knocks her down. Uh, one of the nice uh, uh, things that happened at the legislature was, you know, a bill we've been pushing, it increases penalties. And so what would have been a, a misdemeanor up until July 1st is now a felony. So HPD caught the guy, uh, Jordan Wong, and we've charged him uh, with a felony. And we put out a press release saying we are expecting the judge at sentencing to send him to prison, not put him on probation, regardless of whether he has a record or not. And that's the last part of it that has to happen. And I'm hopeful that the judges will realize. But at the same time, there was a similar kind of case last September in Chinatown, mm -hmm. where a guy, right. well-dressed guy, carrying a skateboard, walks by an older woman. He turns around, he grabs her, he throws her to the ground and steals her purse. Right. She too got caught. So the perception may be that things are more wild than they used to be, but there have been similar kinds of crimes in the past. Let me ask you, when you bring, when you bring up crime against the elderly, has, has that in particular increased? Because uh, we certainly it's a lot of coverage, I got to say, and, and, and uh, there's a lot of video out there. But I mean, are older people being targeted? I think they're, I think they're being targeted for anything, you know, with the scams that go along with the pandemic. You know, people are at home more. They're going to be answering the phone more. That is the problem. And one of the, the I think since the bill passed July 1st, we have had uh, or enacted we've had a number of cases that we are reclassifying. These are very difficult to prove because if an adult male lives at home and assaults his father, you know, it puts that father in a really tough position. If he has to testify, he's worried about getting kicked out of the house. What's the relationship going to be? There may be a financial crutch there. It, I mean, it's a real challenge to do those cases. And I think their HPD opened up a cyber crimes unit with three detectives last year. We increased our white collar unit from 1.5 to four full-time deputies to, to try to handle that. And the elderly are, are a big target there. You know, let me give the chief a chance here. We're talking about perception first. I'll give you a chance to give us a real lay, layout of what you see happening. but. What are you hearing from the community in terms of their demands and their expectations and their um, frustrations with the criminal activity? You know, there is a perception that crime is on the rise, but you know, our stats just don't support that. When you look at the numbers based on the incidents that are reported to us, you know, 2020, like Mike had mentioned, was somewhat of an anomaly. We did see because less people are going out, more people are staying home, crime did actually go down from 2019 to 2020. I mean, it's a lot harder to burglarize a house and break into someone's house when they're home. So when we looked at the different types of crimes that were occurring and the numbers that of the crimes that were occurring, we did see a decrease like in burglary, robbery, thefts, even car break-ins. And as things started to open back up in 2021, of course, because 2020 was an anomaly, you're going to see an increase. But when we look at the numbers from 2021 year to date to the, and compare them to the same time at 2019, really they're kind of on par or actually even in some there are areas where they're below so i do understand that people think you know what crime is on the rise but when you compare them to previous years they're either on par or below so let me ask though um does what do you think is fueling this perception that, that people have i mean is it i mean if people really have that have they always had this misperception or is this something that's new uh, with some other for some other new reason no definitely you know i think anytime you have a lull in crime and then crime goes back up the perception that crime is on the rise is not an inaccurate one crime there the stats do show that crime is on the rise but when you look at what the baseline is and you're comparing it to last year of course crime last year was i want to say great but when you compare it to last year obviously it's going to be a lot higher a lot of the things also that I think are contributing to crime is when you look at things across the nation, all of the different types of events that are occurring. And of course, when things happen here and they're highlighted, I mean, all of a sudden you think, wow, crime is just out of control, but really that's not the case. Uh, Michael Kitchens, what, what are you actually seeing in terms of what's being reported to your site? Tell me a little bit of how your site works. Uh, and whether there's any, you know, is it, can we take statistically significant information out of your site or is it kind of 
just depends on who's got video and who's uh, that's kind of the latter is more of what the way our group works so ours is a perception sort of thing so it's whatever is happening at the moment and that actually is what makes us very effective because people can come to us in their time of need and post about it and that's how our group works so if you've been robbed or your house was burglarized or you had a car stolen then you come to our group and you post about it and then our community comes together and tries to help you you know find the perpetrator find your stolen items etc and the thing is with that is that and I want to just go back to your question that you asked uh, the chief uh, which is that I think social media has had a huge effect in the presence and the perception of crime in our communities. It's just like, you know, when we started off with the written word and we went to radio and then TV and now internet and social media, it expands the ability for people to communicate to each other. Social media is extremely powerful and we can get messages across in an instant. But is it giving truth? Is it presenting truth? I mean, and that is the problem. So social media is a double-edged sword. You know, it can be, you know, very positive in some ways, and it can also help spread misinformation in other ways. That's one of the reasons why we try so hard to regulate the information that gets posted in our group. But I will say that when you have a multitude of people coming to a, a specific spot and sharing their stories, and you see those repeated of all different types, burglaries, robberies, car theft, you know, stolen property, you know, assault, then it, it does increase that perception and gives you the feeling this. And that is one of those things that it's really difficult for us to gauge. We're not a statistics-based group. It's pretty much having your finger on the pulse. That's how I say it. Careful, uh, Kanaga, um, when you hear the chief say, you know, it's down or not, it's not as bad because of the, the, there was a lull that came back, is that your perception as well? Or do you think that actually in your districts, because there's a geographic difference across an island, the chief is working from island-wide statistics for the most part. Do you think that in your area, basically urban Honolulu, there's been more problems than say oh, there were two or three years and, ago? And uh, neighbors have been a lot more vocal. You know, uh, in addition to social media, there there are platforms like Nextdoor where people are constantly uh, posting about you know either suspicious-looking individuals or people who appear to be casing their you know their neighborhoods, and so they're trying to alert each other. And so we've also tried to encourage neighbors that are concerned to consider setting up you know. Uh, neighborhood security watch or crime patrol types of groups because then at least they're plugged in directly with HPD and that will make a big difference you know for them being able to share information and know that the information is going somewhere you know where you can do something about it right because across the country t crime is down the last 25 years mm -hmm. but like you said island-wide the numbers are down but certain neighborhoods they're going to be up if you live in that neighborhood Crime is not down, and if you're the victim of a crime, it's certainly not down. Uh, but I gotta say, you know, we're, we're uh, Stone Stuff Hawaii played a role in a case that's going to start in a few days, so I'm not going to talk about it further. But that that can get out. Right. HPD can see stuff. Other people can see stuff. So that can be very helpful. You know, it's but that's why we got to work together. Like we're starting the Weed and Seed program. Like I've worked with the council member Fukunaga on some other issues. We got to work together and focus on going after the crime where it is. Right. Chief, what do you think the impact of social media has been on the perception and even on the work you guys do? You know, I think social media has made our job a little bit more challenging. Um, like Mike said, you know, when people are reporting things that are occurring to them, like you know, Council Member Fukunaga said, it, it seems very real. And when you compare that sometimes to the number, it may not always be the reality, but it's definitely the perception. But, you know, it also has social media made our job a lot easier in a way, too, is because now we're able to get information out to people quicker. Um, we're able to, especially with our followers, present information that they want to know. Uh, we're able to use the media and social media to get out information, for example, like um, car accidents or we're holding investigations in this area or there'll be training in this area, so stay away, you know. So social media is both very good and can also be very troubling sometimes, but I think we've got to use the technology to our advantage. Let me ask a quick question, though. Um, one of the things, as, as Mike Kitchens was describing, is there's tons of video coming into his site. It gets posted. Someone on television goes, oh, there's a really good video there. Um, I don't know that that woman getting knocked over um, you know, would have gotten any coverage were it not caught on video. Right. Um, you know, when there's a video of a crime that might be a less 
serious crime than one that you want to put some resources on? Do you ever find yourself forced to put resources on a crime that you otherwise would not be that concerned about because the public is saying, you got to solve that crime? Sure. You know, we, we want to be in touch with what the needs and the desires of the public are. And sometimes, you know, when there's a public outcry, of course, we're going to pay attention. But at the same time, you know, you bring up social media, and I just wanted to echo what Council Member Fukunaga and, and Mike said, is that, you know, it, it, and also Prosecutor Alm is, it really is a partnership. You know, we, we need to work together. There have been cases and times where both on next door and also from Stolen Stuff Hawaii, where we got very valuable tips and leads. And had it not been for the videos or the information provided, specifically from next door, a recent case, and I'm not sure if that's the one you're talking about, but we were able not only to get leads through investigative leads, but also locate and identify suspects and bring them to successful prosecution because of those partnerships with like um, Stolen Stuff Hawaii and the app that we use that give a direct connection from the public and neighborhood security watches to the police next door. You know, let me ask uh, Councilwoman Fukunaga, you know, uh, Prosecutor Ah mentioned weed and seed, and uh, recently there have been an effort at downtown Chinatown to really put more officers on the street there. Uh, the mayor made a point of saying, I got to clean up Chinatown. But is there an issue sometimes where when, when you focus on one particular area, it just moves into another neighborhood that's also in your <laughs> district? I think, well, from our experience, you know, within District 6, it's almost like uh, people complaining about homeless encampments. You know, whenever uh, agencies or homeless services providers go to address that particular issue, the, the so-called problem moves somewhere else. And so we're always playing sort of like, you know, running around chasing and, and we said, this really is not very productive. So I think the, the broader effort that Weed and Seed represents is really kind of a weed and seed effort that have to go hand in hand. Then at least when you, you know, when you receive complaints, you can do something productive, mm -hmm. you know, with them. Because otherwise, it's just sort of a never ending uh, cycle. And it doesn't make anybody feel like they've accomplished anything. Right. We, we're convinced that some crime takes place in Chinatown just because of the alleys, the folks that hang out there, the bars, everything else. The same person is not going to be a disorderly conduct five blocks up Liliha. At the same time, the chronically homeless, because of my background with weed and seed and with, uh, you know, with hope probation, drug court, the drug treatment programs have agreed to take a bunch of the homeless people into their programs. So when a HPD arrests them for like drug possession, we're going to have them assessed at OCCC and then into a program so you can help them succeed. We will see if crime moves to the neighboring areas. We are concerned about that. It didn't happen last time, but we'll watch it this time. But we're gonna to try to help the homeless get treatment because if they have mental health and drug problems, unless you deal with that, you can right. put them in housing, but that's not gonna work. You know, really briefly, uh, we did a program on homelessness a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that they said that was interesting to me was that now you have a program, uh, the assisted community treatment program and you have guardian ad litems yes. in court instead of public defenders yes. with these individuals. Yes. Can you give me a sense of how effective that's been in terms of getting people it, treatment? It's already started to have a good impact because I think last year there was a total of one case that made it through right. that Connie right. Mitchell from IHS did. Right. And that's because the public defenders who didn't want to be there had to listen to their client who's floridly psychotic say, I don't want treatment, let me out. And their obligation was to follow them. Now the guardian litem will do what's in the best interest. So already cases are being made and that's gonna help force people to get medication and in some cases get hospitalized. But, but that's gonna be part of the success of Weed and Seed because you're gonna find people in Chinatown who don't have drugs on them, who are not committing another crime, but who are clearly mentally ill. And that ACT program will be one of the right. tools to help them succeed. Let me ask uh, Michael, while we're talking about social media, and how do you regulate what goes on your site? I mean, I, I, you know, we, we in the media, you know, look at that site and we'll pick, a, pick and choose things. And I've seen there have definitely been things put on the media that would not have been covered otherwise were it not for a video of, say, juveniles going into a store and multiple shoplifting going on. It's like that would not get coverage. Um, what kind of stuff? is not acceptable on your site, uh, you know, how do you regulate, say, pictures of juveniles doing something, something like that? Well, when it comes to 
posts. Um, what we're primarily concerned with is what we call blasts. And a blast is where you're putting somebody on, on, on blast who you have not reported to the police. You haven't reported your incident. You know, you're just putting somebody on blast just because What is bla on blast It mean? basically means you're posting a picture of them and saying they did something wrong. Well, that's you know? your, on your site, you have right. something called in blast. in our group. Okay. And okay. Uh, that's one of the things that we're concerned about because our first step, whenever something happens, should be to report it to HPD. So when it comes to those cases where somebody's got video footage of somebody doing something wrong, we request that they immediately go and file a police report if they haven't done so. That's one of the first ways we stop and regulate. Because otherwise, anybody can say anything. It can be the truth or it can't be the truth. You know, it's, Is it, that it's, something it's new or have you been doing that for a long time? We've been doing that since the beginning pretty much. So um, I have an experience, a background in law enforcement with the military, and I've, I've trained law enforcement before as well, so I do understand a lot of the procedures. And it's just important. It's the only way you can really keep people honest. Because if they don't have a police report, then you know they're going to say whatever they want to. You know, uh, Chief, I got a question here that's a very interesting question, and it might open up uh, a couple of other topics here. So we can say crime is not increasing. This is a question that came in by email. So we can say crime is not increasing because we have a shortage on patrol officers to respond to calls or not reported. Um, first of all, is 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 the shortage of officers, and it's been well reported potentially leading to your statistics being artificially low? That is, you, you're not able to get to as many places. You're not out and about. I mean, do you, you think that might be something that's happening? So no, I, I don't think that the shortage of officers is contributing to the lower numbers that we see in crime. I think our officers are dedicated and they're being asked to do more with less resources. But just because we have less officers doesn't mean that they're working any less hard or not able to get to any less cases. I think exactly the opposite. They're working harder and they're getting to as many if not more cases you know it's important to make sure that our officers have the proper resources the proper training and also we need to make sure that in order to get them the help we do that they do need we make sure that we we are doing what we can to in efforts i can tell you that moving towards recruiting our own officers as opposed to working with the um, city's department of human resources who have been very supporting we've been able to go from classes of and recruitment classes of the mid to low 30s to the high 30s to even low 50s in some case and we went from being able to handle two one to two classes per year at our academy to now three and now we even have four classes going per year so that has allowed us to shrink the number of vacancies that we have uh, train them quicker put them all out on the road and have them out there serving the community. You know, there was a um, statement that uh, former Chief Ballard made at some point that I've got so few detectives now that I can't do all the property crimes. Uh, is that still true, or, or, or have you gotten to the point where if someone reports a burglary, a detective will deal with that crime? So, you know, burglaries are definitely one of the issues um, as, it, as it relates to property crime here in Honolulu. And you know we do want to make sure that we appropriate the right number of resources to the right types of crimes, but that doesn't mean that we'll ignore it. So you know CID is one of the areas where we're challenged when it comes to staffing. But moving forward, you know we do realize that solving crimes is very important. So making sure that we have enough detectives in our criminal investigation division is a priority for me. Um, Prosecutor, um, on that point. Um, do you folks see the impact of, of the police shortage on, on the cases you're ever reporting? Well, actually, when I when I looked at the Attorney General's office and I talked to their stats, they had a NIBR stats. It's different from the FBI. These are crimes reported to the police. Uh, and it was down 29% from uh, July 19 to June 20. So, you know, that would be right in the heart of things. And again, if businesses are closed, you're not going to get as much shoplifting. If people are home, maybe not as much burglaries, the ones that happen, maybe more home invasions. But if they have months where the stores open then, they're gonna see a bunch, they may have seen a bunch of crimes. Overall for the year it was down, but for the stores it was, it was not that way. They saw crime. Michael, you wanna say something? Uh, obviously because of my group, I get a lot of feedback from the community. I'm, it's directly, you know, a, a lot of interactions. And one of the concerns that I have seen though is the fact that people have called into 911, for example, and not been able to get an operator. They've called in and, you know, just heard ringing or have not been connected, and then they basically give up and they don't call, they don't report, they try and handle it themselves, or they call back at a much later time. So that is something that I've heard before, you know, that 
that has been kind of a bit of an issue. Um, uh, one of the uh, more recent ones was where an attorney got attacked uh, in the middle of the street, and she wasn't able to report it to HPD in time. You know, so I'll give you a chance to. Sure. So definitely, one of the challenges that we've seen is with our um, civilian hiring, and also with dispatchers. Um, but it's not something that's just unique to here in Honolulu. That's kind of the trend that we're seeing across the nation. You know, recently we've had we had a, a hiring freeze a, from the city, which has um, since um, stopped. But definitely, we're always looking for very qualified people. You know, one of the things that, uh, that me, uh, there was a hiring freeze for civilian employees of HPD. That's correct across the city. It wasn't just for HPD. Yeah, but there wasn't a hiring freeze when it came to officers. But but while well, this was going on. Uh, no, just just recently. I mean, because of the the budget shortfall. Oh, and would, oh, okay. Right when you had the pandemic. So right, you, right. You, yeah, councilman yeah. Fukunaga, you're in the middle of that because you're in the middle of the budget process as a council member. Um, is it a challenge to fund the police adequately? Do you feel, as a council member, the police department is is doing well in in, in these respects? I think from the council perspective, you know, we almost always uh, fully fund. You know, the police department. There are really no limitations that we place on the department. We always look for ways that we can provide more resources, you know, and similar for the prosecutor's office. What I think was happening though was, uh, you know, as you had the pandemic going on through the end of last year, the outgoing administration probably imposed the hiring freeze and cut back on resources in order to kind of distribute, you know, whatever resources they had and make the resources last longer because they didn't know what was going to happen. So I think that was sort of something that contributed to more difficulties, but I don't think that that's um, a, an ongoing practice. Okay, so our viewers are starting to really chip in now, and uh, Prosecutor Rahm, I'll give you the first hard hardball question. My perception is HPD is doing a good job, but prosecutors let these guys go free. Well, I think he's, they, I don't know, I don't know exactly what he means, uh, but uh, you know, right. there was a perception for a while of the little catch and release thing, but that wasn't you. No, and we work very closely with the police. There are partners in everything we do, and uh, the council's been great. We had positions that were, we were actually going to lose in career criminal, and they restored the funding for it. Uh, Councilman Fukunaga is the one who got the money to, for the weed and seed coordinator. So we, we work very closely with HPD, and we're trying to take as many cases as we can. There was a, more than a year where the courts were shut down. Right. And so now more and more, the cases are not stopping coming in. The judiciary since December started doing jury trials. You've got to have trials at the other end in order to get the defense to want to deal the cases that need to, you know, plead guilty to things. But we will, we're absolutely aggressive about taking cases. We look at our charging criteria. And so I would, you know, I would say that, that person may have had a case that didn't make it through. But overall, you know, we work very closely with the police and are tr trying to charge as many cases as we can that's appropriate. You know, Chief, I, I do have to ask, and there's a question coming down the line that, that I think is going to be a tough one, but I want to ask in advance of it. How is the department doing in terms of morale? You've come through a very tumultuous time with first one chief going to prison, another chief who lost a lot of the public's confidence. A lot. She herself said she lost the confidence of the mayor and the council, I mean the police commission. Um, how is the department doing morale-wise, and, and what are the factors on police morale right now um, that might not be positive? Sure, you know, morale is a very personal thing, and it's kind of tricky to gauge. Um, definitely the things that have been happening across the nation don't help. There's a definite different expectation of police, um, not just across the nation, but here even in Honolulu. But one thing I can tell you is that despite those perceptions, here in Honolulu is, is just kind of a different feel. I mean, um, Council Member Fukunaga talks about the support that they, they give to the police department, to the prosecutor's office, and you know Steve talks about that too. And that's just kind of a picture of what we're like here in Hawaii is we all work very, very well together. I mean, we, we have a different situation where our officers, for example, they work in the areas where they live. And that's not always true on places in the continent where officers sometimes have to uh, commute and work in places where they may not be familiar with. But 
everyone kind of knows a police officer here, your auntie or your uncle or your neighbor or your, your child's coach. I mean, it's just a little different here. So as far when it comes to morale, definitely the support that we get from the public is key. I mean, when we have people coming out and thanking us, I had an officer today just from um, the efforts that we've been doing in Chinatown. And, you know, I talked story with him before I came over here and he says, you know, chief, I just came from a shift in Chinatown and we have people coming up to us and thanking us for the stuff that we're doing. I mean, for an officer to hear that, that, that is huge to know that the work that they do on, on a daily basis, putting their lives on the line, not knowing if they'll get to go home at the end of the day to their families and having people recognize that and thank them for the good work that they're, that they're doing, that really goes to increasing and improving morale. So let me see, uh, Councilman Fukunaga, what are what's the feedback the council is getting about the performance? The you know you just had a, a police commissioner you approved yesterday, um, who the, there's a lot of criticism of that appointment because it didn't sh it didn't show that the, the the mayor was interested in the diversity on the police commission that reflects a concern about the diversity in the police department and treatment of certain minority groups and so on. What are you hearing as a council member about things that need to change uh, in terms of law enforcement in, on a wall? I guess from my perspective, you know, a lot of it is within each council district, you have different kinds of issues and problems. And to me, uh, the more we can build relationships you know between neighbors within an area and and the police department uh, the better off we'll will be I, I'll give you one quick example we had um, about four years ago in Kalihi Valley where um, I guess Hawaii Public Housing Authority you know Kalihi Valley homes cracked down on a lot of the visitors and I guess residents whose cars didn't have uh, uh, proper registrations or you know um, current and, and safety checks and stuff. And so a lot of those visitors' vehicles or the residents' vehicles were being parked in another neighborhood across the highway mm -hmm. and driving the residents in that neighborhood crazy. And so, uh, you know, we all kind of got together. We uh, came up with a variation of what they call restricted parking zones mm -hmm. across, you know, the rest of the country. I think and I understand what you're saying. Essentially that sometimes a neighborhood problem will be blamed on the police when in fact they're just responding to something that's well no actually know. what happened as a result of you know that little pilot project which department of transportation services uh, put together we did it very quickly and everybody you know in the wilson tract area kind of signed on and to participate within a month people were shocked at how much of a difference it made because all of a sudden you know instead of having uh, either trash or people doing strange things in their cars parked in front of your house you know etc cetera, etc cetera, the whole tenor of the neighborhood changed and the people who had lived there for a long time were so surprised they said you know my mother is able to walk down the street we haven't been able to you know visit with each other and they discovered that their best partners were were the police officers because the police officers helped to enforce that restricted parking zone uh, type of uh, requirement and after a while they were best buddies you know I mean it it became sort of like um, a whole different community and I think that's sort of the thing that to me makes a big difference when you talk about um, changing or improving you know um, police, enforcement and accountability. It's re restoring that na that relationship within the community with the police department. And at the same time, when the housing project like KPT and Mayor Rights started enforcing that years ago, where you, the only way you could come onto the property was you had registration, you had insurance, that cut crime down by itself. It's so <laughs> smart. And if they're doing that at the homes here, the, the people that wanted to do that can't do that, so they move somewhere else. So they set up this permitting thing, and if people don't have a permit, they can't park there. The police can cite them. It gets them out of there, too. It's a real s just being smart about it. It reminds me of the broken window uh, philosophy where you just sort of clamp down on small misbehavior, and it, it does tend to improve the quality of life in a neighborhood. Do you guys have that philosophy, or 
Is that something that does take a lot more boots on the ground? Yes, definitely. So, you know, one of the successes that we've seen in programs, and we have them in every, every patrol district, is our community policing teams. And really, our community policing teams are officers that are assigned to a special unit that aren't tied to the radio. So they're not having to respond to calls for service, but they're really able to create those pivotal and important connections with the community. Because really, when you think about it, the community needs the police in order to keep them safe, and there's that expectation. But at the same time, the police need the community to trust them and also to provide information and really to be their eyes and ears out in the public. For example, our neighborhood security watches, those are individuals who are committed to keeping their community safe and who are out there taking a look and letting us know what they see, who take the place of officers. And by getting the community involved and you know creating those important community partnerships, that really allows us to more effectively do our job. Okay, uh, uh, Prosecutor Ram, I have two questions on this, and uh, this is one of the tougher ones. Uh, why are you charging the three officers after grand jury said not enough evidence, Brian versus Facebook? Why did you charge the three police officers in the I remember case, John via Facebook? Um, that, I mean, I'm just going to say in covering that case, that you, you stuck your neck out a little bit on that. But also, uh, it the police department <laughs> was up in arms about it. So I'm just wondering, you know, it, can you just talk about those things, to why and whether you're satisfied with the outcome so far? Well, the, the whole idea is that if the department who's involved in the shooting is investigating itself, a lot of people are going to think it's suspect. And that is not a knock on HPD at all. I've worked with HPD for 36 years, great detectives, did a lot of homicides, uh, but somebody else needs to investigate those. And ideally, there'd be an independent agency that could do it. Uh, experienced prosecutors, investigators, that's not on the horizon. And until it happens, our office is best equipped to do this. And so when, you know, I've been at this a long time. When I was the U.S. attorney, we prosecuted some police officers for corruption, for violating civil rights. It's part of the job. And so I'm going to do my best by having our most experienced homicide prosecutors involved in evaluating that. So in a case like the SICAP case, we thought that wasn't a justified shooting. We're going to go ahead and prosecute that. And some people are going to be unhappy with it. Uh, there were demonstrations. They're supporters of the police. I'm supporters of the police. But that doesn't mean that police officers are above the law, just like prosecutors. If somebody in my office or me committed a crime, I would expect HPD to investigate it and then the attorney general's office to prosecute it. Nobody should get a pass. This isn't Russia, this isn't China, where law enforcement is beyond the reach of the law. And so I'm going to do my job to follow through with that. Uh, our Constitution allows multiple ways to bring charges. And part of it is I think people just don't understand the system. They don't understand grand jury. They think often that's a trial that's already happened. That's not the case. There's no argument at grand jury. There's no arguing. Uh, most cases do get indicted, but that's because most cases are appropriately charged. Yeah, let me, let me um, say, though, uh, Chief, uh, I think you would probably agree with everything that he said, except when they did indict, the, when they did charge those officers, your response was not, I'm glad you charged my officers. It was, what the heck are you doing? Is kind of the, I would summarize it that way. And then you had many officers on the street protesting the process of a criminal case. I found that very ironic. What, what comments would you like to make about that? So I think for, for me personally, and I think for a lot of officers and for the department, it just catch us a little off guard. I mean, it, it isn't something that happens all the time. So I think my statement was that it, it, it's a little unusual. But I think one thing that I will say is that we support the justice system no matter what. I think the fact that the officers were out there in support of their fellow officers is not an unusual act. I mean, um, you got to understand that our officers are out there every single day, and it's a very difficult and a, it's a very tough job. And with things going on across the nation, you know, it's even tougher now. Um, and you got to realize that officers have to make decisions sometimes in a matter of seconds, and it could literally mean the difference between life and death. 
But, you know, I, I agree with Steve that that doesn't give them the right to, they're not above the law. But at the same time, it is a very, very difficult job. And um, it is for our officers going through this, you know, it is a stressful time and a stressful situation. Their fellow officers want to be there to support them all they can. And, you know, I support that their officers, their B partners are out there supporting them through this right. difficult time. And I would just ask people to just take it slow and see what the evidence is. Because that's the whole thing. Being a detective, you don't make up your mind in a split second. You evaluate it. You look at the evidence before you decide there's enough to bring it to the prosecutors and charge a case in any other case. And so we're going through the same process here. I would just ask people to, to wait. We've been at this a long, you know, a long time, very experienced in doing this. And people don't want to think a police officer did anything wrong. I don't want to either. This is, did not make me happy to do this. But it's part of my job, and I accept that as part of the job, and let the evidence come out of court, and we'll see you know, how that plays out. So a couple, uh, one thing I'd like to read, Nathan Huaikai, I want to let police know they're doing a wonderful job, and it's unfortunately there's a handful of people who don't respect the title. Mm, thank you. Uh, confidence was lost in the commission, not the police chief, not even via Facebook. And the last question I'd like to get at is, I have a big pile of questions here about catalytic converters. No. <laughs> no, I think, ah, Michael, this is an area, I, I can't even read it, there's so many. Like, what happened to the catalytic converter bill? And what about the catalytic converter thefts? And, you know, people are still stealing catalytic converters. What is with that issue, and why is it resonating to the point where I've got five questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just be honest, it's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things you walk out in the morning to go get to your car and, and uh, you start it up and, you know, there's this loud noise and it's undrivable for some people. And it is so costly to repair. It takes time out of your day. It takes your car off the streets. It is so horrible. And yet it's considered a misdemeanor, I believe. Uh, is, is that the case, no, I believe? It's, or it's, it's, it's a felony. It's a felony, but it's being treated as a misdemeanor? Third, well, it would be, be a third, third degree, right? Or... It, it, these it depends are like thirteen hundred dollars to replace. Right. We're very concerned. We've talked to the police about it. I wish the bill had passed. Uh, what would and, the bill have done? Well, to, to treat it more seriously and about you know looking at the people that they sell this to. Uh, you know, it was the same kind of thing with copper in the past. <laughs> and we're hoping to do some cases that we can't talk about with HPD mm -hmm. because there are only so many places. If you steal it, you can take it. <laughs> And you know we've, we've got to stop because I get the same kind of calls from okay. people. Let me let me ask uh, Carol Fukunaga both in your role as a council member and also your role as a legislator. People are constantly coming up to you and saying, "Can you make this fill in the blank a a, a bigger crime, like crimes against the elderly are bigger? You know, can you make catalytic converter a bigger crime? Can you make stealing leather purses with initials on them a bigger crime? I mean." Did Actually, I don't think we, we receive those kinds of uh, complaints. My mm -hmm. colleague, Senator Rhodes, receives a lot of those kinds of well, requests. I, I mean, as, know, but I'm just in your history as a lawmaker. I'm but in, in terms of um, the complaints we receive, there are more, uh, it's, it's like the nuisance request, mm -hmm. you know, the abandoned vehicles, they're blocking, you know, mm -hmm. the street, cars can't get around them, the trash collection can't be yeah. picked up, and so what can you folks do to get rid of those abandoned cars? You know, it's, it's very little, I think, on the city level that um, tries to evaluate, you know, whether the, um, the penalties are strict enough, except for things like illegal dumping. But other kinds of crimes, we really don't get those kinds of um, requests. It sounds like what, what you're saying, though, is that the public responds more to quality of life issues as opposed to fearing getting robbed or fearing getting robbed. It's like my neighborhood is messed up. Chief, uh, how, what... You know, like I know neighborhoods where there's so many cars parked there by mm -hmm. people who live there because there's multi-generational homes, mm -hmm. the, the houses are built without a adequate parking, mm -hmm. uh, but no one ever goes down the street and cites all the illegally parked cars. Sure. Do, you th do you see a time when the police department might get more involved in that kind of quality of life kind of stuff as opposed to being just complaint oriented? So I think, first of all, I'd like to point out that if our biggest problems here in Honolulu are too many cars parked in the street, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, you know, quality of life issues are something because they affect, you know, your everyday life. You, you expect to wake up. You expect to 
be able to jump into your car, have a great traffic-free ride to work, and then you expect to come home and be able to park in front of your house and go in and enjoy your family. So when things disrupt that, obviously that's when people start to complain about things. You know, and as a department, we need to be sensitive about those things as well. So definitely parking complaints, things like that, those are things that our officers also do take care of. And I mean, it, it takes us away from other things. It's not a high priority, for example, when we go to cases, a priority would be someone just got assaulted, we're gonna go take care of that first. But definitely, once the officer is done with that, finish writing the reports, then they're going to go check their beat and they're going to see, hey, you know what, this car is probably not supposed to be parked over there, which could lead to other things. So definitely, I'd like to just, again, point out if parked cars are our biggest problem, I think we're doing a good job. Okay, um, go ahead, Michael, I, I, and I do have a question for you. Um, I'm just going to say something because I think I really need to use this opportunity, you know, because of the fact that, you know, this is a great platform. But, I'm, you know, I represent a, a large group of people. And every day I wake up in the morning and I have to see what's happened, the same way HPD does, and, and you know, reads the logs and, and sees what happened. My group is basically, like I said, it's the pulse of crime in our community. And there is, there is a lot of anger. I don't think that's being expressed right now. Uh, there is a lot of anger about the amount of crime that they experience. It may not have risen. It may not you know, have been risen. It may be the lowest in, in, in years, but the amount of crime that we have um, when you go and look at the stats, you know, one in 33 people are going to be a victim of property crime here. That is really high, you know, and overall. And it may be inflated a little bit, but regardless, our community, when you go to my group, you see people who have just been victimized over and over and over again by the same people, all again, because they've been through this revolving door and they are not being taken care of. They feel left out. That's the reason why they come to my group is because they want to be able to express. That's the one thing that's different between our group and the news. The news gets, you know, picks certain stories and runs of them. Our group takes everybody. And that's the reason why, for example, there's perception that, you know, this, the crime is rising. But our group is very upset right now. The people in my community are angry. They feel that there needs to be more prosecution. Right. And these people need to be taken and handled it properly. Yeah, I'm gonna, that, this is a question that it does go to Prosecutor Alm, but do you think, though, that what you're looking at is a subset of victims? That is, most of the people are victims of crime and not really a, a rep, rep, representative of the whole community. I just, well, it is, yes. I mean, I would have to say, yeah, of course. Anybody that comes to our group, it's primarily because they are a victim of crime. But obviously, when somebody posts and they're a victim of crime, then you have everybody else in there that comments on it. And yes, it's a very, you know, it's a certain subsection. But I mean, these are people that are victims. Sure. And they're relating their experiences. Well, and so one let, me, let me just let me just make sure I honor our, our question, though, okay. and it's going to go right to what you want to talk about, is Jeremy via Facebook says, for Steve Alm, why do we have criminals with 30, 40, 50 convictions roaming our streets? Well, part of that is you've got to look at, they may have been, they, they have, may, may have been arrested for the, a number of things. They may not have been convicted of all of them. They may have gotten consequences. They may have been prosecuted, did some years in prison, came out, committed another crime. So I'm, I'm fully cognizant of how frustrated people are with that. And one of the things that Michael just brought up, which is a reality, is the person, because the courts were closed for so long, they may have reported it to the police, police investigated, conferred with the prosecutor, somebody got charged, but the case has not been resolved because the courts haven't been opened. So they may be saying, I had a case and nothing's happened to it. Well, that's true in the, because no cases were being dealt with. There were no trials for a year. And so that's starting to open up. That should get better. But the thing, one of the things I've been so pleased about being prosecutor coming in here to an office that I left 26 years ago after nine years there was the deputies are really hardworking. They're, they've got big caseloads that are growing but not being resolved because we're just doing that. They're hardworking. They're, they work extra hours. They're working with the police. They're conferring things. They're trying to get it done. And, and they're the backbone of the office. So I'm really pleased with that. And because more and more cases are now going to jury trial, that should get more cases resolved, more pleas to cases, and, and things should be more efficient, but that the COVID has really slowed things mm -hmm. down. Well, but okay, but, but I've been covering news in this town for 40 years, and 
we've been doing these stories yeah. for 40 years. And so what I'm wondering about is where in normal times is the bottleneck? Are there not enough judges, not enough jail space to liberal bail status, too much, too much liberal probation? I mean, what, where's, the, where's the problem that's, that are systemic that would allow people with, with that level of criminality to be, now again, 30, 40, 50 felonies, they would not be on the street. Right, well as the judge, I was the, I was the toughest sentencer in the courthouse and I could see our probation system wasn't effective. That's why I worked with Shawnee North and started Hope Probation, which has great stats. People in Hope get arrested for new crimes half as often as people on regular probation. So that means the police officers don't have to arrest as many, they don't have to investigate the cases, they go to prison half as often. Native Hawaiians go to prison 43% less often if they're in a strict program like HOPE than in regular probation. So you've got to find the stuff that works and follow through with it. That said, right now, nobody in probation is being monitored the way they should because there's not a lot of drug testing going on, uh, because it takes close, close supervision that way. We've got to get that back up. The purpose of a lot of drug testing is not to catch people testing positive, it's to deter them from using, because if they test dirty in hope, they're gonna to go to jail. Okay, so what you're saying though, does that explain that maybe there's more crime going on? Well, there's more, now there is more crime going on because people are going outside. The system's all out of kill. Than last year. But last year was such a weird year. And during the, and you know, I tried to point that out during the campaign, that crime is down this year because of all the factors people have talked about. But again, if you're the victim of a crime, they don't see it as down, and I wouldn't see it as down if I was the victim of a crime. These stats are great, but. Uh, Chief, uh, from Tim in Waikiki, please address the rise of crime in Waikiki. It was a big topic at the Waikiki Neighborhood Board meeting. There's a lot more people in Waikiki, mm -hmm. but um, I think that for a while we had sort of a wilding group of, of, of criminals running around, lots of fights and so on. Um, what's going on in Waikiki now in terms of crime and are our tourists being victimized again mm -hmm. a lot? So again, I want to talk to perception. You know, when we look at the numbers, like Steve had said, and I think we've been talking about during this entire show is crime was down last year. And then of course, with people coming back, there's a perception that crime is on the rise. In the media, there were a couple of very high profile cases in which people were victims of crime, which if I could point out, we were able to arrest the people who were involved in those almost immediately. But those, what we found were isolated incidents. Of course, last year with tourists not going there, locals not going there, crime is gonna be down. But we as a department realized that Waikiki is really a destination, a worldwide destination. It's not just a destination for, for tourists, but even for locals. I mean, a lot of people go down there and they want to experience what Waikiki has to offer. I mean, just the other day, I was in Waikiki with my family because my son was dancing hula at the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center. And just to see the amount of people there, I was like, wow. I mean, I hadn't been in Waikiki for a long time. I was like, this is a lot of people. So when you have a lot of people in a certain area, you expect for certain things to occur, and one of those things is crime. But like I said, as a police department, we understand that it's a priority, and that's why we have a lot of resources there, our fourth watch officers, our bike officers, patrol officers, really creating a feeling of safety so that not only our visitors when they come, but even our locals when they go to Waikiki, they feel safe. Okay, I'm really short though, Steve. I've only sure. got about two or three minutes. But when, uh, you know, uh, our judges, we have a lot of new judges, they're kind, they're thoughtful, they care about people, but we're pretty lenient as a, as a state, and more people need to get sent to prison at sentencing. You know, that's the way I was. Even then, it's probably 35 to 40 percent. That means most people are going to be placed on probation. And we got to use things like drug court, mental health court, hope probation, so they succeed. We all succeed when people succeed on probation. And then the ones that should go to prison, we got to have programs in there to help them rehabilitate themselves so they don't come out and HPD doesn't have to <laughs> investigate them. We don't have to prosecute them. But I think because people are working together and we got the personalities and we're trying to get our office collaborating with everybody, I really think we can make some good inroads with this. Uh, Michael Kitchens, I only got about 30 seconds left. On your site, would you say that most of the crimes that are being reported are property crimes as opposed to violent yes. crimes? Yes, violent, that's the great thing about Hawaii. Violent crime is so low, you know, but the thing that I think that it comes across is in, in maybe in the news and, and the media and overall is that property crime just is kind of victimless or it's not viewed as the same. 
But man, it can mess up people. It can ruin your peace of mind, your sanctity. Somebody burglarizes your home, takes your car. You can't even get the warrant. It really affects people. And it's what people are most angry about. And Carol Fukunaga, what's your perception? Uh, we're we're going to be done very shortly here. Uh, do you feel safe in this community? <laughs> well, I'm very careful when I walk downtown and in Chinatown. <laughs> um, but I generally feel safe because there's such a, um, a widespread feeling that people are going to look out for each other. You know, that incident that occurred the other day, if the person in Wong's drapery, you know, hadn't rushed out, I think people are just a lot more sensitive now to what they see going on around them and they're a lot more careful. You don't wander around in the, you know, in the streets or on sidewalks late at night. I mean, people have seen that they have to be a lot more careful. Great. Thank you so much and I uh, appreciate all of you at home for joining us tonight and we thank our guests, Interim Honolulu Police Chief Roddy Vanek, Honolulu City Council Member Carol Fukunaga, Honolulu prosecutor Steve Ahm and Michael Kitchens, founder of Stolen Stuff Hawaii. A couple programming notes now. Insights will be off next week. And on the following Thursday, join us for a special 90-minute kako, Hawaii's town hall. We're asking industry leaders and community members how much tourism is too much and who decides. That's Thursday, August 26th at 7.30. Insights will be back on September 2nd. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you.